Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Revamp Founder. In this episode, we have Jeff Saibel joining us. Jeff is the co-founder and CEO of Digits.com, which is the next generation finance stack for small businesses and their accountants. Jeff has had an impeccable career and track record before Digits 2. He co-founded Crashlytics, which was acquired by Twitter in 2013 for 100 million US dollars, which was followed by an acquisition by Google in 2017. Now, Crashlytics runs on 6 billion monthly active smartphones, so he sure has built an incredible company. Before Crashlytics, Jeff also co-founded Increo, which was acquired by Box in 2009. In this episode, we talk about what it is, what it looks like of selling a hundred million, selling a company for hundred million dollars, the different types of acquisitions, how to build an incredible team, how to build an incredible product, and what is an incredible product, and so much more. This is an incredible episode. Do listen to it to the very end. So, hey Jeff, how are you? I hope you're doing well. I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. Yep, it's a pleasure on my end. So, I guess. Let's give our, give a good, kick it off with a small introduction. Who is Jeff Seb? Well, I am a, a serial entrepreneur, uh, programmer by background. I fell in love with computers and programming, at, I think, when I was 12 at a very young age, um, and have just become obsessed with building things and hoping to start companies, trying to start companies uh, that we can build great software that saves people a ton of time. And I've had a privilege of being able to do that in a couple of different industries, in developer tools with Crashlytics, in accounting and finance with Digits. Um, and I also spent a bunch of time at Twitter as head of product, head of consumer product as well. Yep, that, that's an incredible. I started to code when I was 11. So yeah, awesome. it's incredible. It's an incredible thing. Also, I think let's start with a bit of a story, I'll say. What does it look like when you sell uh, or when a large company like Twitter acquires uh, your company for 100 million, if I'm not wrong? Yep, that's right. Um, Every acquisition is very different and they're all very fun stories. Uh, The Twitter one was particularly interesting. So we had launched Crashlytics in 2011 and uh, got very lucky with timing. In about a year, we had grown from zero to 300 million smartphones. Um, So just incredible growth. And Twitter called us out of the blue. Uh, one of their corporate development people. And we got on the phone with them and they were like, so um, have you ever thought about working for Twitter? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, why would we have thought about that? Um, and they were interested in mobile. They wanted to do more things with developers. And so we talked a little bit on the call and we we're like, okay, that's weird. We don't know what's happening, but it doesn't really make sense. And so we're like, okay, great. We just keep going. And then three months later, they called back and they were like, no, no, we're actually very serious. We think you should come work for Twitter. Uh, would you at least come out and like meet our executive team? And the real kicker was at the end of the call, they were like, don't worry, we'll pay for your flights. And so we're like, okay, fine. Right? Like we'll fly. We were in Boston at the time on the East coast. Uh, we flew to San Francisco, met with the leadership team, including Dick Costello, the CEO at the time. And were very impressed. They gave this very detailed pitch of how they saw the mobile ecosystem developing, what they saw Twitter's role in it, how they viewed developer platforms, and how critical Crashlytics could be to that vision. And it was a fantastic sales job, honestly. And I think in those conversations, they converted us from sort of very skeptical to like, why would we go join Twitter to actually this would make a lot of sense and help Crashlytics as a product because they were willing to make it free put their brand behind it and resources behind it and help scale it even further. Um, So this was really over the course of then a few weeks negotiating the deal, figuring out all the details. And uh, by that January of 2013, we were full-time at Twitter. What is the difference between an acquisition and just buying a company? Yeah, there's sort of three different types of acquisitions. Um, So if you, and it really depends how strategic the partnership is. Um, So you've probably heard the term aqua hire, which is a lot of smaller companies, if they're not doing well, really their most valuable component is the team itself. And so they might get aqua hired by a larger company, in which case that company just really wants the team. They want the talent. Um, And so the product goes away, whatever they're working on changes, then they come in and join the other. The next step up is 
um, just sort of a, a product acquisition. They want what you've built. They want your revenue. They might want your customer base. And so these tend to be more in the middle of the range and you would ideally keep working on your product at the larger company. Um, and then the most sort of highest value deals, and you can look at these, these are all well-known, Google buying YouTube, um, the Instagram acquisition by Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. These are what I would describe as strategic deals where the value they're willing to pay is way higher than the company is probably worth in that moment because they see the downstream implications and what they think they can do together. And so that's sort of the dream outcome for a startup founder is to position yourself for some sort of strategic acquisition where it makes a big difference to the larger company. And which one, uh, which side of the coin were you guys on? We were more on the strategic side for Twitter, which was interesting. Um, they had about six months earlier written a very unfortunate blog post, uh, sort of insulting developers, killing off their developer platform. And they had realized this mistake. And so they used the Crashlytics acquisition to sort of reset the relationship with mobile app developers at the time. Um, and so it ended up making a big difference for Twitter. Who was uh, Crashlytics rightly valued or overvalued, undervalued? <laughs> I'm sure everyone will have their different take on it. Um, what was interesting is at the time, people were very surprised and impressed by the size of the acquisition over $100 million dollars. For something that was so new, we had just launched a year before. Um, in retrospect, Crashlytics has grown to be massive. It's now on 6 billion monthly active users. And so in retrospect, you could argue it probably undervalued the company at the time. And today, Crashlytics is probably worth 1 or 2 billion in terms of what it's accomplished. Um, and so you never know, right? There's no perfect decision in the moment, uh, but we were very, very happy with the outcome. Uh, Google acquired Crashlytics after Twitter, right? Firebase made it a part of Firebase. Yes. What do you think that Twitter sell it off after buying a strategic? Like yeah. So four years actually to the day, amusingly, uh, from when we joined Twitter, uh, Twitter made the decision to sell Crashlytics to Google and a lot had changed in those four years. And so Twitter in the interim had gone public. Uh, I think had very famously started struggle to keep growing. Growth had sort of slowed down and flatlined. They had done a couple of other acquisitions that were as successful, honestly. Um, and through that, they realized they couldn't afford to keep this large developer platform running just based on the growth of the core product. And so they, they fortunately realized they could not shut it down. It was way too big to just turn off. And so they started looking for another strategic uh, acquirer to find the right home for it. And so Google ended up being that fit. And the teams continued at Google to this day. And it's now the de facto crash reporter for Android. Uh, so the team which you guys are, the main, the core team, when you were a part of Crashlytics, when Twitter acquired it, the people who worked before that and after the acquisition were the same? Or do they change too? No, it's all the same. And so that's what was really amazing. Uh, when we were acquired by Twitter, the team was 18 people. And over the course of the four years at Twitter, we grew that team to about 65. And when Google acquired us, all 65 went over to Google. And a lot of them are still there today. And it's been over 10 years. And so just the, it's a, an amazing team, amazing culture. Um, and it was such a privilege to work together. And they, the team loves working with each other. And it's just been super impressive to see how long it's stuck together. How does the um, the founding or the leadership team in the starting stages, how does the each and every person's equity change in the company when it is acquired? Do they buy it off of your what? How do... That's a great question. Um, so when an acquisition happens, there's basically two components to the deal. And so they make an offer for the company. So they're buying all the equity and IP of the company. And of course, a lot of that goes back to the original investors and it depends who owns the business. Um, and as employees obviously get stock options, they would have a piece of the business so they get some money from that. But that all gets bought out. Then the second piece of the deal is the offer letters for the team. And so in order to continue and join the acquirer, You'll get an offer letter and hopefully it'll have some new equity component. 
And so you're given stock in, say, Twitter or, say, Google, as it may happen. Um, and so that's what keeps the team together and working forward because they're investing new equity at the larger company. That's yeah, they lose the part they had in the small business, but they yeah. get new equity at the larger business. So do you, do you still have equity in Crash I don't think so. I didn't. Do, I do not anymore. No. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. But I, but as with everyone, I got some equity at Twitter at the time, and then yeah. was able to invest that over the four years. Yeah. Then you took your exit and started digits. Exactly. Also, so we talked a little bit of team there. So how do you build? How did you build a team that scaled the company to such a large scale in a single year? That's yeah. Kind of team building is probably the single hardest part of startups in my mind, uh, and it can really make or break the company. And everyone has very different theories on how to hire talent. Um, I believe in a few things that I think might be unusual. Um, one is I've only ever hired senior or experienced talent. And I think a lot of startups begin with very junior employees, first time founders, first time engineers straight out of school or whatever it might be. Um, and the challenge there is you're trying to do two things at once. You're trying to teach your team how to work and how to build software. And you're also trying to build a product and deliver it to the market. And I don't believe it is the job of startups to train talent. That is the luxury and the responsibility of the large companies. And so if you're a first-time employee, first-time engineer out of school, you can go get a job at a big tech company and they'll teach you how to write software and how to work, right? But as a startup, you don't have that time. You need to race to market and build a really great product. And so we started by only hiring experienced talent. And then the other thing is I look for a combination of two attributes. So the challenge with senior experienced talent is some people can become very opinionated and set in their ways and perhaps frustrating to work with because it's their way or the highway, right? And so I look for senior talent who is also chill. And the aspect of being chill is actually really important because you want to be able to work with people and debate ideas back and forth, don't have anyone get angry, uh, just have sort of fun trying to figure it out. And as a result of that, it's actually a really powerful combination. Now in 10 plus years at these different startups, I've never seen an argument in the office. It just doesn't happen because everybody has experience, knows what they're doing and is chill and open to new ideas. And so it's actually a really great combination. Now, I'll let go back to your first point. So I recently had Jason Fried on the podcast. He wrote Re Rework. Yep. I think you might know it. Uh, so... He, I asked him, I mean, somewhat of the same question to what I asked you right now, but he had a different opinion. Like when you hire people, you hire new talent, you should throw them in the deep end so that they can figure it out themselves. And do that. So how do you think does that correlate with what you said? I think that's a great point and applies to everyone you hire. And so your goal as a founder CEO is to bring great talent into the company and then get out of their way. And I think so many people make the mistake of hiring people and then trying to micromanage them and right and like look at and approve and nitpick and criticize like every little thing they do. And that's very demotivating. And so I think Jason's right. You want to bring great talent in, throw them into the deep end, get out of their way, let them figure it out. And that's very empowering and very motivating. And I think ultimately your team will work harder and be more successful than if you were trying to like get in the weeds of everything. But how do you manage the team without getting in the weeds of everything? Depends on a couple of things. Um, so how what your goals look like and how frequently you check in. And so one of the other things I've done across every company I've started is run them on a weekly sprint. So a very, very fast cadence. And the way this looks at digits is we do a Monday kickoff meeting. So the whole company gets together every Monday morning. And we set goals for the week. And so every team shares what their goals are for the week. And then Wednesday, we all get back together and do a check-in meeting and go through the goals and see what the progress has been, who needs help, what's ahead of schedule, what's behind schedule, what do we need to change, et cetera. And then Friday afternoon, we all get back together and we do a show and tell. 
and everyone shows off what they did that week. And it could be something you built, a blog post you wrote, a design you did, whatever it might be, right? And so this has a great aspect of this shared responsibility because you see everyone's goals all across the company and you see everyone else making progress on their goals. And so if you're falling behind, it's a little it's a subconsciously awkward. Um, and so that's a really great motivation to have the whole team pulling together and we welcome help. So if someone's falling behind on something, people will offer to help and try to speed boost it so that they hit their goals for the week. And so in that way, you're not in every little weed, every little decision, but you can create this environment where people can really perform. You mentioned that you meet a lot, meet a lot of times in, during a week. Yep. There's a common narrative of async work, asynchronous work. Yeah. So do you think is async work important? Because if you, I, I think that if you have a lot of meetings at the company, it kind of becomes a roadblock sometimes. Yep. We totally agree. And so you have to prioritize which meetings are important. So we have these three meetings each week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And apart from that, we aim to have no other scheduled meetings. So at Digits, you are not allowed to schedule a meeting more than 24 hours in advance. So there's no recurring meetings on your calendar that fill up your whole week. If you need to meet with someone, just ping them on Slack and they can either chat right then because they're not in other meetings. Or if you want to set aside some time to talk more at length, then schedule a time either later that day or for tomorrow. And so what that means is you don't actually have a ton of meetings and we spend most of our time in a async flow, just like getting work done um, and collaborating. We do a lot of pair programming um, and just sending docs back and forth online. And so you're right. Async is critical, but you want to really value the couple meetings you do have. You, you talk a little about code there. So uh, Digits, I think, is your second like big company, relatively big company. So when generally what we see, and not there are exceptions, what we see is when people have a relatively big exit. Now, I don't know if you had a big exit or not, but it was uh, relatively bigger than the other one. Yep. Then people calm down a little bit. They're like, they don't want to go that fast. So why, why start Digits right after building something which has impacted a lot of people? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I sort of think I'm I'm cursed. I just love building software. And so if I had nothing to do, what would I do? Code, right? It's the greatest thing on earth. Um, and so after Crashlytics, I did take some time off, which was great. Um, after leaving Twitter, that is. Um, and so I took almost a year off and it was great to do some travel and relax and step back. But towards the end of the year, I missed coding. I missed building something um, and working with a great tight knit team to create something. And so I think it was also a, a part of it was Crashlytics was great, but we could have done even more, right? Because we scaled after being acquired. I wanted to see the experience of really scaling before being acquired. And so part of the goal with digits is, okay, let's take on an even bigger industry and even bigger opportunity, which is all of finance and accounting. And how can we make something truly huge? And so we're still in that battle. We're still on that journey. Um, but it's so much fun. And it's 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 fantastic to be able to wake up every day and build great software. How much do you code at Digits? So Digits today, we have 36 people on the team. Uh, 21 of them are software engineers. So we have a, a very strong engineering team. And as a result, I don't get to code too much because I would just slow them down. Um, but I do every once in a while get to write a little bit of code just to stay fresh and, and stay involved. And all these uh, 21 developers, they are senior developers or are any of them like mid-level or intermediate? Developers? It's pretty much entirely senior developers, as I said. Um, yeah. And what is unique about this team is half of them, 11 of them, are from the original Crashlytics team. And so I was able to convince them to leave Google to join Digits. Uh, and as a result, I've worked with them across three, four different companies for 12 years now, which is incredible. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, that, so how do you, when you build, when you build Digits and you switched over from Crashlytics to Digits, how do you get into that mindset again that 
the building mindset because it, it, it sometimes it metaphorically comes naturally but i don't think it does it in my opinion yeah really great question i think it comes with being obsessed with the problem and so the problem we're chasing at digits actually came from my experience at crashlytics and so it, at crashlytics the product worked we saw all this great growth and we had a lot of great instrumentation on the product side so you had google analytics and uh, real time ab testing tools and dashboards and performance monitoring and everything in our product we could see what was happening and who was using it and how many phones were pinging us and crashing and so on and then on the business side there was nothing right we got our pnl and balance sheet and cash flow statement once a month two to three weeks late and i had no idea what was going on and so that was so frustrating and that was why we started digits was it was like wait why the dichotomy why is data visibility so good in product and so bad in finance and can we make finance and accounting real time and so ironically the original code name for digits was cash lytics just tell me about my cash and that got myself and the team very excited and we're like okay great let's go figure this out <laughs> all right <laughs> that's that you should have gone with that name <laughs> we do well in the domain so <laughs> uh, so I, i'll drift over here a little bit so how many co-founders should you get on board when building a startup really good question um so for my first company uh way back in 2008 i had two other co-founders uh both my most recent ones crossflex and digits i had one co-founder i would highly recommend particularly for first time founders that you always have a co-founder um i do think probably having one is better so it's just two of you um versus more the challenge with having more is it's harder to make decisions quickly because you need to always loop in everyone and there's more likely to be disagreement just because there's more voices around the table. And so then you sort of fall into the trap of deciding things by committee versus just a really high conviction let's go in that direction and go for it. Um and so I would always have at least one co-founder and the way to think about it is uh look at what you are good at and be really honest with yourself about what you are bad at and then find someone who's the opposite. And so then you can perfectly complement each other and you have a founding team that's very strong for the business. You have another component that there's um uh, there are different equity splits which people try to follow like 33 33 33 33 three founders. Yep. So and the CEO generally uh, should have more equity as compared to the CTO CMO. So at Crashlytics you uh you you also had a co-founder so what did the equity split look like between you yeah so you're right the common advice is never make it equal the ceo should have more right think about like how you want to break it down i have never listened to that advice and every company i've ever started it's been equally split um and so what and i actually think that is the right choice um and the reason is you won't be able to predict day 1 whose contributions will be more impactful and you both need to work incredibly hard in order to make the company successful and anything you've done before will pale in comparison of what like the work required going forward and so if you're relying on you having a few more points of equity than your co-founder in order to make a decision you've already lost right like that's not even important what's important is is the product good and can you get customers and will they pay you and so i actually think just by making it 50-50 it eliminates all the drama and confusion and debate that you should is a wasted energy you should be spending that energy on serving customers so how do you then in that case let's say uh, you have 50-50 you have 50-50 equity split so in that case who gets the veto power in general no one that's the point and so you have to agree and which is critical because if you don't agree as co-founders you're going to tear the company in two halves and so by forcing that it's actually a way healthier dynamic and i think far more successful for the business so did 
did you know all of the, all this when you were starting the company so you you were a first time founder uh, no second time founder after increo yep so what did you learn at increo about team building that you applied in crash it yes great question we learned a lot and so increo was my first company i started it uh, my senior year of college in 2008 with two of my friends um and we made a lot of mistakes so some funny ones uh in america you assume taxes are always due on april 15 and so we were assuming we'd have to file taxes on april 15 we had no idea that that's not true and business taxes are actually due march 15 so we missed that that was awkward um uh one of the more important lessons was the two friends i started it with were my best friends in our computer science program and so the three of us were great engineers but we didn't complement each other right none of us knew marketing at all and the bigger problem was none of us even cared about marketing and so we didn't even pay attention to it or think about it and that was a huge trap because we spent all this time building what was a pretty great product but nobody used it because we didn't know how to sell it or market it um and so when i when we uh we were able to sell in creo to box fortunately yeah. um and when i left box uh the first thing i promised myself was i would only start a company if i could find a co-founder on the business side who would complement me and so that was the huge early learning and mistake we made yeah that's i mean uh, as as a programmer do i i um i used to think that who cares about marketing build it and they'll come yep that that doesn't work <laughs> it did not work at all it's that is the biggest lesson um and so it was interesting in starting crashlytics i wanted to find a business co-founder it's also hard because as an engineer how do you know if the business co-founder is good right they they talk very well and so i was also skeptical um and so when i met uh wayne who ended up being my co-founder yeah uh i didn't know at first like should we work together or not and he was actually amazing he he we met up talked about crashlytics and he said this is not a side project this is a real business i want to be involved and i'm going to get every app interested and i was like okay right let's see what that looks like and sure enough 3 weeks later he followed up out of the blue with a full spreadsheet of mobile apps their lead developer their feedback on the idea and their commitment to use the beta and this wasn't some random app you haven't heard of this was like vp of mobile the weather channel and he had spoken with them and i was like okay maybe we should work together <laughs> yeah we talked a little bit about you getting the business guy but uh, generally what we see is the uh, opposite the business guy getting the tech guy so yeah tech has become like a bottleneck these days for starting a startup so do you think business people who are on the business side can build a uh, uh, tech startup i don't think they all just are, i don't think that they can build developer tools you need to have both of them have to be technical and those but yeah what do you think? i think that's right and so it depends what market you're going into um what i really look at even from the investing side because i now do a lot of angel investing is what i would describe as founder market fit right how good of a fit is the founder in that market and so if you are a business founder yes don't go build developer tools that's probably not the right market for you um but there are a ton of markets where you're a fantastic fit and they're largely sales driven or you have some unique insight into the market or the people or the network whatever it might be and so then you have the challenge of okay how do i find a technical co-founder to come build this with and so what i would recommend is get really involved in the scene and so there's all of these meetups about different programming languages now about ai show up to these meetups meet the engineers there talk about your idea and this is really your first challenge because you need to be good at selling your idea and if you're good at selling your concept and the market and why this is a big opportunity i would bet you can get someone excited to come build it with you and if you can't it's probably a tell that you need to improve the idea and market opportunity further to in order to attract a great team that, yeah so talking about a, you talked a little bit of great team there great, in, great point I, don't, i totally agree with that so how much 
So first of all, it's like the podcast targeted towards beginners. So I'll just ask a basic question. What are ESOPs? Great. Yes. Um, so when you, let's say you've now found your co-founder, you've started the business, you've incorporated. That was another mistake I made. Make sure you go and incorporate the company where you get started. Um, and then you go and hire some employees. Obviously, you want to offer them stock. And so uh, there's lots of different guidelines on how much for what type of role, et cetera, et cetera. But let's just say ballpark, you're hiring a first engineer. You probably want to offer them somewhere between one and 4% of the company. And they're going to be your founding engineer. They get a large equity stake compared to other employees because you need them to, you need to work with them to help build this thing. Um, and then it sort of just like gradually falls off from there. So let's say if your first engineer was 2%, you might hire your second one at 1% and then 0.75 and then 0.5 and so on. And it just like slowly declines until if you're about 10 to 15 to 20 people, everyone's probably getting 0.25 to 0.5% of the company. And so when you start the business, uh, your investors will ask you to put together an option pool that you can then give these grants out of. And that pool is usually anywhere from 10 to 20% of the company, probably most typically around 15%. And so you'll have this pool of 15% that you'll start giving out to employees as they join. Um, and what's great is when you next raise your next round, let's say you go out and raise an A round, that pool will get reset as part of that fundraise. So then you have a new chunk of stock to give the next set of employees. Got it. So I have two questions into this. So first is, how does the equity uh, correlate with the decision-making part? Mm. It really correlates with how critical they are to the business. And so not really decision-making power because no one, no one really is going to know who owns what equity at the company. It's usually not public. Um, but right. you want to make sure your most valuable people stay. And so you want them to be very highly motivated. Um, so the way I look at it is who is sort of strategically critical to make this product and company work. And those are the people you want to give more stock to. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that, that, so how does you give talks in the, in the starting, you said that it gradually declines with the engineering gap. So how does a large companies like Google, uh, and Microsoft, they also have ESOPs. How do their ESOPs differentiate from a startup? Yeah, so a bunch of different ways, and this might get a little technical. Um, usually with startups, you're offering them real option grants. And so they will vest options to buy shares of common stock in the business. Once the company gets big, like let's say Google, um, you would get what are called RSUs or restricted stock units. It's a different tax treatment that's not quite as favorable. Um, but on the flip side, you also can get an employee stock purchase program because maybe the company is public and you can just buy shares at a discounted price. And so I worked at Apple uh, back in the day and that's what Apple did is they would let employees buy their public shares, but at discounted prices in order to motivate them. Um, and so it definitely, it changes by company, but the big difference is like, let's say if you're at a very early stage startup, you could get half a percent or 1% of the entire company at Google you're getting a tiny, 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 tiny fraction. Um, so it's very, very different. But the uh, ratio of but the value of Google is uh, relatively high. So a tiny percentage would be worth a lot. And sure. the same is with the startups. The value is small, but the equity is large. Exactly. And, and then it's a different risk uh, as yeah. well, right? At a startup, maybe your stock is worth nothing. But if it's successful, maybe it's worth 10 or 100 times what it is today, right? Versus at Google, your stock's probably never going to be worth nothing, but it's also probably not going to 10 or 100 times. Maybe it's 2 or 3x what it is today. So you uh, talk a little bit about when you're an Apple and they give you stock options, uh, stock, uh, the discounted stock price. Yep. So... It works at a relatively big company. Apple is a huge company, so it works there. But in a startup, people, mostly people who join startups want to code or want to work at it because for the love of the industry they're in. Yeah. How do you motivate people at that stage without like stock option that is hardly anything about? 
but more than right. Yeah. Most people I would say do not join a startup for the money, right? Yeah. Most startups can't really afford to pay that well. I think you join a startup for the dream and the ability to have an impact and work with a really small team and create something from nothing. And so as a startup founder, you want to select for those people in your interview process. And so I ask in every interview, what are your goals? Why do you want to join the company, right? Like what motivates you? So I understand where they're coming from. And then you want to paint a vision that's exciting and describe how that person can help like achieve that vision. What impact will they have on that vision? And in my experience, that motivates the right people, um, right? Based on what they care about and what their goals are, if you can paint that vision, they are super excited and anxious to join and work hard because you're creating something. Do you, uh, related to this, do you hire people who are incredible, like George Hodge level programmers? Do you, but they don't have a specific love for the particular industry that you're working in, but they're incredible at the skill. Do you hire those people? Yes, it depends on the role and, and what you're looking for. But I would say great engineers tend to get excited about hard problems. And so, as I said, a lot of our current team at Digits was the early Crashlytics team. 10 years ago, we were very excited about developer tools. Today, we're very excited about finance and accounting. No one before we started Digits had any experience in finance or accounting. We actually had to hire an accounting professor to teach us a private class so we sort of understood accounting. And so from that perspective, what motivates great engineers is how hard the problem is. And there were some interesting parallels that the way Crashlytics worked, you're basically classifying bugs, right? You're trying to figure out what a bug is and what line of code you need to fix. The way accounting works is you're basically classifying transactions. You're trying to figure out why the money moved, what it was, where you book it into the chart of accounts. And so from a technical perspective, there were some very cool similarities between the engineering challenges that got the team very excited. Um, and so, yes, I think you can find very strong generalist engineers. You just need to really motivate why the problem you're solving is super interesting. Awesome. So we talked a lot about Tillier and about building an incredible team. So you built an incredible team. You have 100x engineers in your team. How do you build a great product? What is a great product? That is the million dollar question. Um, product is really hard and it's really hard to find and hire great product managers because so much comes into taste, right? Like what is a great product? It's hard to measure. And maybe at Google's level or Twitter's level, you can run experiments and look at the data and see what makes it better. But at a startup, you don't have data, right? You don't have enough users to actually measure. And so you need to have some implicit aesthetic, some taste that you want to apply to the product. And I draw a lot of that from my experience at Apple and just their obsession with simplicity. And I think one of the bars we try to strive for is it's so easy, you can't help but use it. It's like, it's just immediately apparent how you achieve what you want to do with that product. Um, so that's a really critical thing to strive for. Another thing that we really care about is moments of delight. So when you're using the product, when are you sort of surprised in a happy way? You're like, oh, that worked, right? And you can actually engineer delight into a product. And so one of the exercises we do is look at every screen of your product, take screenshots of them, and draw smiley faces, right? Like, what is the user feeling at each screen of your product? And if they're going through some sort of sign-up flow, honestly, they're probably getting like more and more frustrated, right? Because there's like more things they have to type in. And so their, their smiley face is like more of a frown. And so if you notice that as you're like looking at your product flows, that's where you need to inject something surprising and delightful in order to like break them out of that. And what's really powerful with human psychology is if your product triggers delight, your customers will associate delight with your product. And so when they then talk about it with other people, they'll talk about that excitement they felt, that delight they felt, and that's super powerful for word of mouth distribution. You, you, 
the same thing. The, you talk about sign up there. I have a really big problem with sign ups. I am. I always think, how can we improve upon them? How do you think can new startup founders improve upon their sign up? And yeah. Or, so. Um, so a couple things. What is your time to value? So I didn't come to your product to sign up for your product, right? I came to it to get some value at the end. And so how can you make sure you deliver that value in under a minute, right? No matter what. I think that's a really critical thing to aim for. And then for the sign up flow, it's how little information do you need to collect up front and what can you really collect later on? And how do you sequence those fields so that the user sort of just falls in? So like do the easy fields first, like, okay, what's your name, whatever, right? If you need more complex information, draw it out into a couple screens, make it very clear what they're doing so that any given screen feels very easy. And before you know it, or and before they know it, they've now put in enough stuff where they're like, okay, I have to be almost done and we'll just finish it. And so really think through the psychology of every step of your signup flow and how you can shorten it and like just get them to the value. Yeah, I think that's why uh, I like uh, products which have a timeline on mm -hmm. the signup process. So like, your name on uh, details, person, those things. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Sign up is messed up. It's, it has not changed for a very, very long time. It totally, I totally agree. So, um, sign up and onboarding is terrible and passwords and authentication are terrible. Oh. And so I would really push to see like how much of your product experience can you deliver logged out? Like, can it do something for you even before they make an account? And then you have to make an account to save it or something right? Then they've experienced the value before committing to going through the whole process. How do you, let's say you build a great sign up process too. You are like incredible people are loving your onboarding process. So how do you guide each department in your startup as, a, as chief, everything opposite? You, the design yeah. department, the tech department and business part and get. Yeah. I think your primary goal as the CEO is to bring context and alignment. And so you're not going to be the best at programming and marketing and sales and business development, right? That's why you hired these people. And you should have hired people better than you because they know what they're doing. They have, they're doing the job. And so your goal isn't to step in and tell them how to do marketing. Your goal is to bring the context of like, hey, here's what we're building. Here's why. Here's the general story we want to tell to the market, right? How can we go and market towards these customers and sell them on the product? Um, and so the way I chat with our different groups is again, every week on this cadence, trying to make sure their goals are aligned. So like for this week, what are you all trying to do? Okay. Are we all swimming in the same direction or is some group like going off and doing something else? And you're like, wait, 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 like, how is that related to all this other stuff? Um, so I'd say that's the primary role. But you have to have, uh, an idea or a relatively be a generalist uh, about every department. So you have to know a little bit about finance, about tech, and not tech in general. I think CTOs, uh, co-founders, CTOs are pretty useful in that. So when you uh, were building, I, I want to talk about this. Crashlytics was less on the consumer point, consumer side. Uh, digits is uh, on that front. So at Digits, how do you, you have a team of 37? 36, uh, yeah. 36, yeah. So, how 21 of them are developers. So a major chunk of the main, main team is developers. How do you manage the team practically? No theory, no theory. Yeah, this is also something that we do that's very unique. I'm not sure how many other companies take this approach, um, but we did the exact same thing at Crashlytics um, and through our experience at Twitter as well. Um, so we have a flat team um, and instead of sort of firm reporting structures and everyone has bosses and so on. Instead, we have three coaches. And so three of our 36 people are full-time coaches and they coach the entire team. What I mean by that is everybody at the company reports to one of the coaches. And it does not matter what department you're in, if you're in marketing or BD or engineering or whatever design, um, everyone reports to a coach. And the coach's responsibility is simply uh, sort of your career trajectory, mentorship, what are your goals, how's the company working for you, interpersonal relationships, all of the management type of stuff. 
they have nothing to do with what you work on. And so every week when we do this weekly kickoff, we decide what are the teams for the week and who's working on what together. And what this means is we can very, very quickly shift teams and shift priorities. And so every week, if we need to pick up something new, we can form a new team of a couple of folks to go work on that. And you can do that without doing any sort of reorg because people get very stressed out about reorgs and, oh, my boss is changing and so on and so on. And so what we've done is we've just detached the two, right? Your coach is always going to stay the same, but they have nothing to do with the work for that week. You're paired with two or three other people that week on your project team. And so that's how we run the company in terms of these project teams. Meanwhile, everyone's reporting to our coaches and they handle all of the one-on-ones and more management style stuff. Well, who are these coaches? Are they the leadership team, like the C- C-suite? I mean, nothing is C-suite in the startup, but what? who are these coaches? Yeah, so we also have no real titles internally. Yeah, um, yeah. We don't have a C-suite. Um, <laughs> Two of them are uh, two of our early engineers who have been with the company since day one. And their sort of career goals were always to move out from engineering into more management. And so they've been fantastic. And then we hired in one coach who actually also came from an engineering management background. Um, We have found that sort of running the whole company in more of an engineering style has been very effective for us. Um, and so the fact that they have engin- they all three coaches of engineering backgrounds has been fine from that perspective. It's not like, remember, their goal isn't to tell the marketing team how to do marketing. And so the fact that they have a different background isn't important. What's really important is they're very strong managers and they're very aligned in style and how to motivate teams. Yeah. That... So do you, as, do you also act as coach to... I sort of people that coaches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think every startup CEO should do that? I think it's very up to different personality and what you're optimizing for. Um, in my experience, this works yeah. very well because it also removes, as I said, any drama around reorgs, any drama around titles, any drama around reporting structure. And like, oh, so-and-so got promoted and now reports to this person and I don't. It just simplifies all of that because, again, at the startup stage, your goal isn't to train talent and worry about internal noise. Your goal is to deliver a product to customers. And so every decision I've made has been focused on basically minimizing internal discussion and focusing all discussion on what does the customer want and how quickly can we deliver that. So you you mentioned a part about uh, the whole narrative was about looking at it from a customer's point of view. Now, I saw a really good uh, example of something like this, that good sportsmen, good, good sportsmen are, uh, they know how to play on the field while imagining what it looks like from the crowd. Mm, yes. so how do you connect to that? I love that description. That's really great. Um, and I think that also goes into what you reward. So a trap some people fall into and some founders fall into is you may have one person on your team do something great, right? And you then shower them with praise and make an example of them and so on. And yes, that's good, but you know that not everyone on your team can do that. And is that actually the most important? Instead, it would probably be better if that person went and helped everyone else, right? And made the whole team better. And so what we publicly praise and recognize at the company is collaboration. Um, And so the way we do that is we actually end every week at our Friday show and tell with what we call anchors and breezes. And anchors are things that slowed you down this week, things that didn't go as planned, like areas you need help or input for next week. And there's usually a handful of those each week, and that's great. And we share them in front of the whole company. And then we end with breezes, which are speed boosts, things that sped you up, went better than expected, tools, tips, et cetera. And the breezes turn into this huge sort of just thank you and shout outs section of like, oh, thank you so and so much. This person helped me do this faster and so on. And so that really celebrates the collaboration, right? What made you go faster 
not how much did you personally achieve. And you you hear about people falling into a trap of measuring how many lines of code your engineers are writing. That is horrible, right? Some of our best engineers actually write less code because they're spending so much time helping everyone else write their code. And yeah. so you need to really pay attention to what you're rewarding and what you're tracking in order to make sure you don't just destroy the culture. Yeah, that's building a culture is the toughest part, but the most important part. And when it's a mo- remote, it's like even harder to build culture. That's what I asked uh, Jason about a controversial thing which, which happened at Basecamp that they banned, yeah. not banned, but restricted the talk about pol- policy and social discussion that work. So I think it was from the founder point of view, it was for building a good culture and not involving politics and ideologies with the work. Yeah. But I think people take that narrative in the wrong way. Right? Exactly. And, and that is the hard part as a founder. You really need to think about how your words are understood and interpreted by people who may have a different perspective. And so it's really important to me to build this inclusive culture. It's like, hey, everyone is focused on the same goal, which is delivering value to our customers. That is what's most important. And trust that everyone has the company's best intentions in mind towards that end. How do you connect your team seamlessly? Like you have to move with speed. At startup, that's the, that's the biggest advantage. I mean, clear this for me before getting to the main question. Moving at a faster speed at a startup is an advantage. But moving in the wrong direction, you can run towards the wrong direction, but that's uh, not an advantage. So how do you measure that out? Yeah, that's a great description of it. Um, I would say speed is important, but being intentional is even more important. And so a perfect example of this from the engineering side. So every time we start a new project, which is usually at least once a week, because we have 21 engineers, so a bunch of things are happening in parallel, um, we don't just start coding. That is a terrible idea. And so we usually spend the first day to two days actually just writing an architecture doc on Google Docs about what the project is, why we're doing it, what we're trying to do, and how it's going to work. And you could argue, well, why are you having engineers write a Google Doc for two days when they could just write the thing, right? And the answer is, it is way faster in the long run because you think through all the challenges you're going to hit You get other people on the team to weigh in and give advice and help. And then when you're ready to start the next day, you know the plan and you can just write the code very quickly. Um, And so I think you, in some cases, need to go slow to go fast. And it makes a huge difference. But how does that, uh, how does this uh, writing the architecture on a Google Doc and then implementing it, how does that uh, relate with the common narrative that build fast, experiment fast and all those things which people do. Yeah, I would say design fast and yeah. test fast, right? Yeah. You, you don't want to code fast. Coding is slow. And you yeah. don't want to test things in code because that's a waste of time. And so we do a lot of design iterations. Our Figma files have thousands of different versions of things we have never built. But we are constantly designing things and then getting customer feedback to see what they like and don't like and then iterating the design. And so I would do really rapid design prototypes, but be very disciplined about what you actually code. How do you, what are your, some takes on design in general? So you have some pretty incredible points that you mentioned about uh, the management and the technical side of things. But when it comes to design, what do you think is wrong? This is ID. Well, so this is a good question because I'm not a designer. So yeah, I don't know as well. Um, I, yeah, I think the the new tools like Figma have been a huge improvement for the industry instead of keeping everything stuck in Photoshop. Um, you can really unlock collaborative design, which has been fantastic for us. Um, and I think there's a constant tension between uh, sort of minimalist and maximalist design and where you fall in that. And so like everything, if you look back way to iOS 7, everything was very skew more and graphical. Then we went flat. Now it's sort of coming back a bit because flat design is also a little boring and unemotional. And so it's really fun to see these ebbs and flows. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to get, uh, I asked, I mean, I'm taking a lot of examples from the one I did with Jason because there are, because two different narratives from you 
uh, earned from him in a lot of different things. Yeah. So I got a designer perspective and a yeah, technical perspective. But yeah, that's that is super interesting. I just have the last question, uh, or maybe last two questions. Uh, once you align the team with the vision, how do you align the investors? Ah. Well, hopefully you're doing that sort of in parallel as you're raising money and building your team. Um, but I think the key is to just really set this big vision, right? Great team members are really motivated by a big opportunity and so are great investors. And so I've actually never seen a difference between the two. I think if your opportunity is right and your approach is right, both employees and investors will be excited. Yeah, that's, that is such a good point. So last question, what advice you have built incredible companies uh, we're working on digits which is i think very cool if i put it that way appreciate but, that yeah so what advice would you like to give to people who are just starting with building out building things or young builder great question um yeah to end my biggest piece of advice is build something and ship it a lot of people are working on side projects that never see the light of day and you really have to get the experience of just shipping it and getting a couple users and seeing what they think and then taking their feedback and making a new version of it. And that's the most powerful exercise. And I think that's where I learned the most early on. So as I said, I, I taught myself coding when I was 12. I released a couple Mac desktop apps uh, during middle school and high school because this, these were the late 90s. Um, and so I was writing Macintosh shareware. And... Through that experience, I learned what it was like to have users and get their feedback and fix bugs and so on. And you just learn so much. So my biggest advice is like, just do something and ship it and everything will roll from there. That That's an incredible piece of advice. And I think, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's it from my side. That was an incredible way to end it. Anything you'd like to say? No, thank you so much for having me on. Really, really fun. Yeah, same here. It's been meaning for a very long time. That's incredible. Just... Yeah.